Tonight, I talk about Kecksburg, Pennsylvania and the odd acorn-shaped object that crashed in the woods just outside of town. Then I head to Poland to talk about the Nazi bell. Could these things have been one and the same? All that and more on Small Town Secrets. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three, season one of Small Town Secrets. I trust everyone is having a good time out there. This weekend, I spent three days in Kentucky hiking, and I found a couple of fun stories. Hopefully, I'll be able to cobble them together into an entire episode down the road. A couple of ghost stories and just a couple of fun history things from down there. We'll see what happens, but that's all in the future. Tonight, we're going to be talking about some UFOs and some time travel and some other things. Uh, like a lot of shows out there, I try to find stuff that hasn't been covered a whole lot. But, you know, every once in a while, you just got to do the stories that you really like. Um, I know the Nazi Bell has probably been talked about ad nauseum on a couple of shows, and I'm sure Kexburg has been touched on as well. But Kecksburg, maybe not not as much. I couldn't even find... I figured when I started, I was like, oh, I'll be able to find like a Kecksburg book. Like, there'll be a really good Kecksburg, Pennsylvania book. And there's not. There is a book, but from all the reviews I read, it is uh, terrible, so I didn't even bother with it. I just found some internet research. But yeah, no great books on the Kecksburg, Pennsylvania UFO incident. I did read something. I'll keep an eye on it that later this year they're going to do a documentary film on it. So that might be something to look forward to. But that's what we're talking tonight, uh, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, and Sokolek, Poland. I do want to give out a trigger warning before we get into it. There's going to be a lot of German names and a lot of Polish names and words in the second part of the main feature of the episode. I'm going to try my best to pronounce them as correctly as I can, but I can't make any promises, so if you're offended by the butchering of words, you've been warned. Before we get into Kecksburg, and then we're going to get into the Sokolak Poland and the Nazi Bell, but before all that, we're going to listen to a promo from the Murders and Miss podcast. Do you like true crime and murders? Do you like mythology? Well, this podcast is two great tastes that taste great together. So take a listen, check it out, and we'll be back with the Kecksburg, Pennsylvania UFO incident. This is Kimberly. And I'm Kristen. Hosts of the Murder and Myths podcast. In our podcast, we tackle a common theme and bring you two stories. One of true crime, where I discuss murder and unsolved cases. And one of mythology, where I delve into the darker side of Norse, Egyptian, and other lesser known mythos. You can find us on Twitter at Murder and Myths and our website, MurderandMyths.com. Our new episodes are available on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, and Spotify. So please leave us a review and let us know what you think. And don't forget, come for the murder and stay for the myths. 
on December 9th, 1965, an anomalous object was tracked on radar and seen by thousands of people as it streaked across the night sky. The object flew over six states, as well as Windsor, Ontario, in Canada. It was reported that it left traces of hot metal over parts of Michigan and northern Ohio. After causing sonic booms in western Pennsylvania, it came crashing to the earth just outside of Kecksburg. The original explanation was a meteor. In 2005, NASA released a statement saying they had studied debris from the site and confirmed it was a down Russian satellite. However, NASA's findings for Kecksburg were lost sometime in the 1990s. Was it a satellite, or was it something else entirely? Back in December of 65, the humble people of Kecksburg didn't know it yet, but they were about to become the Roswell of Pennsylvania. If it was a Russian satellite, as NASA claims, then it was most likely one called Cosmos 96, or, if you want to get technical and sciencey about it, 3MV-4 number 6. 96, as I'm going to refer to it, because I'm not saying Cosmos 96 and 3 over and over again, was intended to go to Venus as part of the Venera program. 96 was intentionally supposed to go to Mars. However, it missed its launch window and was repurposed to join the Venera program and make a flyby to Venus. Cosmos 96 would never make it to Venus. In fact, it would never leave Earth's orbit. Upon its launch on November 23, 1965, a fuel line ruptured. 96 re-entered the atmosphere on December 9th and crashed back down to Earth. This sounds like a plausible explanation. It did crash on the correct day, and the satellite could do all the things the Kecksburg object supposedly did. However, there seems to be some evidence and analysis that suggests that 96 actually fell to Earth hours before whatever crash in Kecksburg did. The residents of 1965 Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, a small unincorporated town about 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, say something very different crashed, and if you can't tell I'm making quotation marks in the air with my fingers, in the woods. There were uh, a couple of witnesses, of course no names, it's always fun when you get witnesses with no names because it could just be anybody, it could be a story, it could be nothing. A young boy saw the object land, and the boy's mother reported hearing a thump and a vibration as the thing landed. So now it's not crashing, now it's landing. Many volunteer firefighters at the time said they went into the woods and found a large acorn-shaped object, about the size of a Volkswagen bug, with strange hieroglyphic-like characters at the base. Remember those characters for later, it's going to come back in the second story. Somehow, the military showed up and said that absolutely nothing was found out in those woods. The townsfolk, on the other hand, say different. If you ask them, they will tell you the military did indeed show up, and they did not leave empty-handed. Witnesses claim they roped off the scene and hauled out a strange acorn object on the back of a flatbed semi. I have a picture. I used it for the episode tile. Uh, it's on the website. It's a really cool picture. It shows a, a flatbed army truck and this thing that pretty much looks like a bullet. I don't know where this came from. I'm pretty sure it's not authentic. I would like to think that if our military did find a weird acorn-shaped UFO in the woods of Pennsylvania and loaded it up on a flatbed truck that they would have the sense to uh, cover it in a tarp because this picture just shows it sitting there. It's a, it's a great picture, but I'm pretty sure it's probably a Photoshop job. It's not. It can't be authentic. It can't be real. Unsolved Mysteries did a segment on the Kecksburg UFO incident and made a nice little prop which now sits atop a pole in front of the Kecksburg Firehouse that you can go visit. I have a picture of that in the show notes as well. There was even a newspaper article from the Tribune Review, which is actually kind of hard to say together, Tribune Review, from the nearby town of Greensburg. The article was entitled unidentified flying object falls near Kecksburg. Army ropes off area. The article stated, quote, the area where the object landed was immediately sealed off on the order of the U.S. Army and state police officials, reportedly in anticipation of a close inspection of whatever may have fallen. State police officers 
they are ordered the area roped off to await the expected arrival of both the U.S. Army engineers and possibly civilian scientists. That was about it. I mean, that's most of the news coverage, if not all of it. You know, it came out later. Hey, it's a meteor. Slam, bam. We're done with it. We're not going to talk about it anymore. There have been attempts to confirm not only what the object was, but also to figure out its exact trajectory. A 1966 issue of Sky and Telescope determined the object that flew over Windsor and Michigan probably landed in or near the western part of Lake Erie. They did this by analyzing sightings of the object that were reported to the FAA. In 1967, the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the JRASC, used photographs and seismographic records to pinpoint the object landing on the northwestern shore of Lake Erie around Ontario. The JRASC article shows that whatever the object was, it didn't show up anywhere near Kecksburg. This may be a little disheartening, but it must be noted that the two astronomers who wrote the JRASC article use very narrow data. Even small errors in their prediction could make for large differences in trajectory. It's also interesting to note that the pictures of the object show a thinning trail, as if it were moving away from them and not towards them, as the astronomers surmised. It would be a long time before anyone else would tackle the subject of trying to nail down the trajectory of this object seen in the night sky. It wouldn't be till 2003 that the Sci-Fi Channel did their own investigation, which involved taking a look at a series of trees with broken tops right around where witnesses say the object hit. Core samples of the trees confirmed the date of the damage to be 1965. There was also minor ground disturbances discovered. This is interesting. Um, you get some people that say it crashed, you get some people that say it landed. If this is real evidence of it, you have broken trees, you have ground disturbances. I would have to go with the thing crashed, I don't think it landed. I'm also kind of wondering about these ground disturbances, like would 1965, 2003, uh, I'm an art student, so math is not my strong point, but like, would there still be, like, would these ground disturbances still be relevant that long ago? Could you pin that down? I don't know. And then there's the 2005 NASA statement that I mentioned earlier, and there are lost files. Well, even after FIO requests and court orders, nothing turned up. In fact, in 2008, space writer James Oberg said that NASA may not have anything, and never did. Apparently, it was a common occurrence back in the 60s for plainclothes military officers to identify themselves as NASA officers. Which, to me, makes sense. I mean, back in the 60s, especially 65, I mean, NASA was all the rage. You know, we're getting ready to go to the moon, and we're doing all these satellites, and we're taking all these pictures. NASA was the hot thing in 65. So, that's a great cover. Go in and say, hey, we're NASA, we're taking care of it. No questions asked. But really, it's the military, and they've always had the evidence. They've always had the object. And that really is about all there is. It's not like Roswell... I mean, I guess it's Pennsylvania's Roswell, but there's just not a lot going on. We don't know where it went. My, if I had to surmise, because I live really close to it, it probably went the right path. Because everything kind of goes the right path in the end, all these crashed UFOs. Why wouldn't you? It's, it's not even a day's drive from there. But even though there's not a whole lot there, it's a very interesting case. I like it for a lot of reasons. One, it's not entirely far away from me. I could get to Kecksburg. I think I routed it out once. It'd be like a like a weekend, weekend trip, but you could get there and get back. And it's got a lot of witnesses. Uh, no names, not a lot of them. But if all these firefighters went out there, you should be able to find those out. You should be able to find dig up those names and interview those people. Maybe I should just write the Kecksburg UFO book since there isn't a good one. Mm. And the other thing that I like, the other thing that's always intrigued me about it was the symbols on the bottom of it. They were they were um, described, like I said, as hieroglyphic-like. And we've heard of that before. Uh, Roswell has some hieroglyphic-like symbols. You see those all the time. But then I wonder, did they really see alien writing? Or, let's say it was... Uh, a downed Russian satellite, which it very well could have been. Back in 1965, how many people would know what Russian looked like? The Russian characters. They would be very hieroglyphic to someone who 
who has never seen Russian writing. It would be a very, very alien, very hieroglyphic, once again quotes, uh, thing to see. Or, as we're going to get to in just a little bit, maybe it's something a little more mystical. So with that, I think I'm going to finish up on Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. If anyone out there lives in or near Kecksburg, or lived in or near Kecksburg, and has any more insight, maybe your grandfather was one of the firemen or something cool like that, write into the show. Get me up on Twitter, at STScast, which is probably where I'm most active. Or go to STScast.com, write me in, let me know. Maybe we'll do a little update. Maybe we'll do an interview, something cool like that. But let's get into Sokolek, Poland, and the surrounding area, and Die Glock, or the Nazi Bell. There are a few towns named Sokolek lying around Europe. The one we are constraining ourselves with tonight is the one located in Lower Silesian Voidenship in southwestern Poland. Prior to 1945, this land was part of Germany. The area around Sokolek, Poland is best known for two things. The first is Project Reis, German for giant, and Die Glock, or the Nazi Bell. I'm going to talk first about Project Reis because I find it just interesting. It was a huge military construction project that consisted of a lot of underground bases and a couple of repurposed buildings around the area. One is a castle, I think, and the other one, we'll get into it, and the other one is just a big mansion. None of this was finished. If you look at pictures, oh God, I should post some pictures. I can do that. That's the thing I can do. If you look at pictures of especially like the underground base part, it's just a bunch of tunnels. Like it just looks like caves, really. They didn't get hardly anything done. All of the stuff is populated with the same stuff, you know, uh, work camps and construction equipment and all of that. So before we get to the bell, let's talk about Project Rice before we get into that. It'll give some it gives some great background on what was going on in the area at the time. Project Rice was a major construction project spearheaded by the Nazis in 1944 and 1945, in which nine structures were to be built seven of which were underground or had underground components. None of them were ever finished. No one was really sure what all these complexes were really for, as there doesn't seem to be a lot of documentation about Project Rice. The first is Kazai's Castle. This was a castle located at what at the time was Waldenburg. In 1941, the owners of the castle fell into debt soon after the castle and its lands were seized by the Nazis. The castle was renovated and modernized, such as adding a new staircase and elevators. However, most of the construction went to underneath the castle, where two levels of massive tunnels were to be built underground. So, once again, underground component, and I don't think it was ever finished. Next was Complex Rzeka. This complex is located in Ostra Mountain. Construction started in 1944, with three tunnels being drilled into the side of the mountain. The tunnels lead to a completed guard room and large meeting halls. Above ground was machinery and a couple of bridges. The next one is Complex Wooldors, another structure built into a mountain. This complex was built inside of Wooldors Mountain. This one had four entrances and was mainly a series of tunnels and more halls. Some of this complex was flooded and is now accessible by boat. Then there is Complex Jugoweiss. This complex was built into Jaroniki Mountain in the village of Judoice. This one had six entrance tunnels. Tunnels 2 and 4 led to a small series of hallways and more tunnels. Tunnels 1, 3, and 5 are in various stages of completion and, of course, unfinished. Tunnel 6 is collapsed and remains unexplored. I'm sure there's something great in Tunnel 6. The Red Room is in Tunnel 6. A bunch of Nazi gold is in Tunnel 6. A UFO is in Tunnel 6. That's where you gotta go. That's the good one. Next up is Complex Soban. This complex is built into, you guessed it, Soban Mountain. It has three entrance tunnels. The third one has collapsed. Another collapsed tunnel, probably full of great stuff. Not much of this one was completed. 
It's very sparse and was found with mining equipment still in it. And then we have another building. Jedlinka Palace. This was a massive, is a massive palace located in the village of Jedlinka. It was purchased in 1943 by the National Socialist People's Welfare with the intent of turning it into a hospital. The German military, however, had other plans for it. The military confiscated the building and turned it into the headquarters of the Silesian Industrial Company. This was the company that was put in charge of building Project Rice. We then have, wait for it, Glazikia. The town of Glazikia was mainly used as a labor camp. It also housed the two textile factories that were converted to make armaments. An air raid shelter was also built there. I'm pretty sure this is the only one that's not, a, not an underground base or a reused building. This was just a town that was converted for other uses. Then we have, last but not least, Complex Sokolek. This one was bored in the side of Guantoo Mountain, near the village of Sokolek. The structure is actually two structures on two levels. It's similar to the other complexes inside of mountains, however a lot of this one has collapsed because of the soft sandstone that the mountain was made out of. So this is, this is all of them. And this entire area, which is going to be a gigantic complex for who knows what. I want to pause here and talk about uh, Sokolek for a second. There's a lot of small towns around this area. And when I mean small, I mean small. It's like, I look at some uh, Google street views of these towns and it's, it's, it's a one road, some buildings, small child on a bike, and that's it. I went with Sokolek because it's the most major town in the area that's, that the Nazi Bell was probably used at. It may not have been the exact town, but it's the biggest. And if you're going to go check it out and explore, Sokolek is probably where you would get your hotel for the next couple of nights. But now let's talk about Die Glock. Die Glock, the bell in German, or simply the Nazi Bell, was first brought to light when former Obergrubenfuhrer officer, and that's the highest commission officer rank in the SS, Jacob Sorenberg was put on trial for the murder of 60 German engineers, scientists, and technicians. He stated that all these people were murdered in order to keep the Die Glock project a secret. The bell was built inside Project Rice area, around the area of Sokolek and Milkow, Poland, now near the flooded Wenceslas mine, which has its own stories. Old stories. Might we might have to re we might have to revisit that mine and do another episode on it. It may have been tested near Milklau on a large ring concrete structure with pylons that supported the ring. It resembles a modern stone hinge. Uh, detractors, I mean not detractors, but skeptics of the Nazi bell theory say that these are nothing more than water tower supports. And I did I did do an image search of uh, water tower supports that were made this time in Germany, and they do look a lot like this. But the one that I think this is, is the one near Milkow that people call the Henge. And whenever you look at pictures of these water towers, it's always, they're out in the middle of the woods, they're overgrown, they're forgotten, you know, it's hard to get a size on them. Some of them are very small and narrow and very high like you would think they are. But the one in the Henge, the one that's called the Henge in Milkow near Sokolek, is different. It's actually a museum, and I don't know if it's a museum museum, it's more of like an exhibit. It's just there, you can go visit it. There's some there's some trucks, some old army trucks parked around, other things of that, you know, plaques. There's a little thing to look at. And it's very grandiose for a water tower. It's not out in the woods, it's not overgrown. It sits on a big slab of concrete, a parking, you know, almost like a parking lot or some sort of small runway or something. It's very, it's very ornate. It looks very important. If it was a water tower, then it must have been the most magnificent water tower for Project Rice in the area. But I digress. The Nazi bell is described as a device made out of a hard, heavy metal, approximately 9 feet wide and 12 to 15 feet high, having the shape similar to that of a large bell or acorn. 
It is said to have contained two counter-rotating cylinders that were filled with a violet metallic liquid known as Xernum-525. Xernum-525 is a substance used to make uranium-233, which could have been used to make a nuclear weapon. This is the most official explanation for the bell. The bell was some sort of particle accelerator to create U-30... I'm sorry, turdy? <laughs> to create U-233 for a bomb. There are many theories as to what the bell may have been used for. It was part of a weapons project, as I just mentioned, most likely used to create 233 for use in nuclear weapons. The bell may have had anti-gravity properties. The two liquid-filled cylinders, when combined with a highly charged electrostatic tube, may have created anti-gravity propulsion. No one really goes into how that works, but it sounds, it sounds cool, right? The bell, and this is my favorite one, this is the whole reason why this episode has a theme, might have been a time machine. There doesn't seem to be any real info on how it achieved this feat. However, I'm going to assume that if it did, it must have traveled in the time rather uncontrollably and was lost in the testing phase. If the Nazis did have a real handle on time travel, then the world would be a much different place now, wouldn't it? The bell and the Kecksburg object share many similarities. They both could be described as a bell or acorn shaped. Both objects allegedly had strange writing, perhaps runes. Because if we know anything about the Nazis, if you've done any esoteric research into the subject, you know that they were probably really into some ancient stuff. They were not just a political party. They were they were a cult. They were into occult things. And there's many great podcasts that go into this. There's many great books that go into it as well. Not really a subject for this show, but if you're interested dig into that. So, like I said, could it be that in 1944 or 1945, the Nazi bell shot forward in time uncontrollably, only to appear in 1965 Pennsylvania, and then it crash-landed near Kecksburg? Allegedly, when the bell was activated, not only did it create a buzzing noise, it also created a field of activity several hundred feet in diameter around it. Strange things were said to have happened within this field such as crystallizing animal tissue, decomposing plant matter into a greasy substance, and separating and congealing blood. This active field was said to be so powerful near the bell itself that it would vaporize anything or anyone who was close enough to the actual bell. To this day, it's not clear what happened to the bell. It didn't tra if it didn't travel forward in time and crash in Kecksburg, then where is it? Released Nazi documents tell us the bell did exist, and in the death throes of WW2, it was most likely loaded onto one of Germany's massive Junkers Ju390 planes. It is not known where this plane was en route to. Some say the Arctic Circle, or more likely, South America. If I have a picture of a Ju390 in the show notes, they were massive planes for the time. I'm going to go with probably South America. I'm not one that buys into the whole, uh, the, the Nazis went to the Arctic Circle and have a secret base, or have a secret base on the moon. Everything went to South America, you know, all the Nazis that escaped went to South, everything went to South America. So maybe it's there, hidden in the jungle. Or maybe it time traveled and crashed in Kecksburg, which is just the funnest story ever. But that's the Nazi bell. And I mean, there's a lot more to go into. There's some great books on the Nazi bell. But if you don't believe any of the fun stuff, the time travel, the uh, anti-gravity propulsion, where the Nazis trying to make a UFO, where they trying to reverse engineer UFO technology, where they using ancient magic, the runes, to make this thing move, where they using... Like I said, some alien technology. Maybe the writing is alien. We don't know how alien stuff works. Hey, maybe we just got to write on it. It works. But even if it is like we were just using this to make uranium, think of how close. A lot of people will. A lot of people believe, and there's a lot of documentation out there now to support this. That the Nazis were days, weeks from completing nuclear, a nuclear weapon. 
and then everything went to shambles and they had to get it out there. They had to load it on the planes and now it's gone. They were close. We know that now. And that in its own right is terrifying to think of how close they came to really achieving their ultimate goals. It does make you think. So whatever you want to believe, the wackiness, the not so wacky, or the probable, either way you slice it, Die Glock, the Nazi Bell, Project Rice, all of that is just very interesting. But we're going to take a little little musical interlude now, and we're going to come back with some wacky local headlines. Maybe not wacky. I might be disrespectful when I'm done, but we got some headlines. We got some fun stuff in the news this week. The first story we got is short and sweet, and just like a couple weeks ago, first episode I think, I talked about how the Roswell Ranch land around the crash site was up for sale. We've got another great story, another great paranormal site up for sale, as the ruins of historic Bolskine House on Loch Ness are up for sale. This comes from the BBC News, it does not have a author for the article on it, but it reads, the ruined home of former notorious Satanist, debatable, wasn't this, Aleister Crowley has been put up for sale. It is on the market, along with over 22 acres of land for over 500,000 pounds. Mr. Crowley is said to have carried out what he claimed were black magic rituals at the property near Foyers between 1899 and 1913. The building, which was later owned by musician Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, is reported to be haunted or even cursed. A major fire ripped through the B-listed Georgian Bolskine house above Loch Ness in 2015. The selling agent, Galbraith, said echoes of the former splendor are all that remained of Bolskine house, but added that there is an opportunity to restore it as an outstanding property. I'm going to go ahead and read the, uh, there's a link to the fire story also on BBC News, also without an author. 
It's also very short, but it ties in here. Firefighters called to historical Bolskine House on Loch Ness. Firefighters have been called to a blaze at historical property above Loch Ness. Crews from Foyer, Inverness, Bewley, and Dingwall have been set to Bolskine House near Foyers. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service said a large part of the property had been destroyed. Bolskine House was owned by infamous occultist Alistair Crowley and later, for a time, by Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page. The alarm was raised at 1340, 1300 hours and 40 minutes. Flames from the fire were visible from the other side of the lock. A fire appliance from Foyers and another from Inverness were first sent to the scene. Pumps from Inverness and Bewley along with water carried from Inverness, a pump from Dingwall, and an incident, an incident support unit from Inverness have also been sent. SFRS said a large part of the property had already been destroyed by a fire and crews are concentrating their efforts on the west wing of the building. Crews and breathing apparatuses are using four main jets to tackle the blaze, and the incident is ongoing. Crowley, who died in 1947, lived at Bolskine House above Loch Ness from 1899 to 1913. He was infamous in the late 19th century and early 20th century for his promotion of the occult. During World War I, he wrote anti-British propaganda. He was also an experienced climber and was part of an ill-fated attempt to scale K-2 in modern-day Pakistan in 1902. I did not know that. Musician Page brought Bolskin House in the 1970s because of Crowley's connection before later selling it. And if you don't know, uh, Page was a big magic practitioner, as was David Bowie. And there was actually some kind of, kind of a magic feud between the two for a little bit. Next up is a story uh, from Oregon. This comes from Oregon Live, the Oregonian, by Mitchell Russell, is the author of this article. The headline reads, Corpus found an Oregon home of missing Disney Mouseketeer. Police have found a corpse in the southern Oregon home of a missing Mouseketeer, Dennis Day. On Thursday, Phoenix, Oregon police asked Medford death investigators to examine the body found at 510 Pine Street, a home belonging to Dennis Day, one of the original members of the TV's Mickey Mouse Club. Day was first reported missing last summer. Authorities have yet to publicly identify the remains or release more details about the circumstances under which they were found. Day, 76, appeared on Mickey Mouse Club during the show's original 1950s run. He was first reported missing July 15th by his husband, who suffers from memory loss and was in the hospital at the time. According to Missing Persons Report, Day uncharacteristically left his dog with a friend on the day he disappeared. His car was found at the Oregon coast on July 26th. But the investigation didn't pick up steam until December, when Day's family was told of a local news report about the missing persons case. In February, Dateline spoke with Day's family members, including his sister and original performing partner, Nelda Atkins, who voiced her displeasure with what they called a poorly handled investigation. We are devastated, Day's niece told NBC. We had no idea anything was happening, and six months into it, we figured it out. We should have been notified. Friends and relatives helped us set up the Help Us Find Dennis Day Facebook page. On Friday, reports from the Medford Mail Tribune spotted an Oregon State Police forensic truck outside Day's home. According to the post from Nice, Dennis Norris, the activity around the home followed a police search Thursday. Born in 1942, Day began his performing career at age six after moving to California. By 10, he was among the first group of children hired by the Disney show. Day and his longtime partner, Ernie Caswell, moved to Oregon in the 1980. They were married in Ashland in 2009. And the last story I dug up for this episode comes to us from coast to coast and is written by the great Tim Banal of the Banal of America podcast, and he also now writes for Coast to Coast. As I think he's the news, he's the head news guy, he's the news editor now. But it's a fun Chupacabra story, as Chupacabra slays 71 farm animals. A farmer in Mexico lost an astounding 71 animals to a mysterious nocturnal predator that some suspect could be an infamous Chupacabra. The gruesome slayings reportedly occurred over the course of the last few weeks on Simpelinco Martinez's property, which is located near the base 
of the Sierra de Juarez mountain range. According to the beleaguered farmer, the first incident took place on March 28th, when an unknown animal somehow killed 20 of the farmer's sheep in one night. Already reeling from the tremendous loss, Martinez's luck got even worse when the mysterious beast returned to his farm again last week. During this event, a night watchman at the site heard a commotion where the animals are kept and ventured out to investigate. Despite being armed with a machete, the guard opted not to intervene in the situation after he spotted what appeared to be a black creature of tremendous size. The next morning, Martinez discovered a whopping 51 chickens had been killed by a voracious predator. As often is the case with these type of killings, a number of odd elements surrounding the attacks have raised suspicions that they may have been the work of the chupacabra. Specifically, the farmer noted that the creature apparently entered the chicken coop by way of a hole that it had created in the roof, which was at least six feet off the ground. That means, Martinez mused, either it climbed or it flew. Additionally, he observed that the predator consistently bites at the jugular of its prey and drains them of their blood which is another classic method of attack attributed to the fearsome goat sucker of paranormal lore. Although a local veterinarian insists that the culprit behind the killings was merely a canine of some kind, Martinez is skeptical of that assessment and argues that a dog would not have had such a precise style of attack. It's not a normal animal, the farmer opined, speculating that it must have been some kind of massive beast since it consumed the blood of twenty sheep. Be that as it may, Martinez now simply hopes that the authorities can investigate the matter because he and his neighbors fear that the creature may move on, feasting on humans now that has decimated the animal population of the farm. And that has been this week's Local Headlines. And now is the time where we take a couple of your stories of your small towns. We have two tonight. The first one is from Ty Bannerman of the Anytown USA podcast. And he wrote in saying, Hey, I'd love to tell the story on your show. And he didn't tell the story, I'm going to read it. Just down the street from where I live was the ugliest mansion you've ever seen. And it is indeed ugly. I'm going to post a picture. It doesn't look like a mansion. It looks like, like a badly designed elementary school or something. It was made of bricks and looked like a prison or insane asylum. It is also abandoned. It had been the home of Bill List, who made his fortune via the invention of a certain kind of trailer hitch, and whose daughter, Debbie Thornton, was murdered by Carla Faye Tucker. Anyway, Bill had a habit of picking up teenage boys in Houston and driving down to his mansion, keeping them around as a sort of indentured sex servant. He was very controlling and cruel to them. Finally, got too much for the current group, and they ambushed him with a shotgun. When he got home one night, they killed him instantly. They swiped some stuff, a bit of money, and graffitied the place with crude depictions of Bill's sexual proclivities before fleeing in his car. They were arrested in short order, and the house cleaned up and put up for sale, but nobody would buy it. A series of caretakers moved in and then out, sometimes with stories of ghosts and the like. The neighborhood kids were prone to sneaking in on occasion, basically as a rite of passage. Finally, however, in the late 90s, the land was sold and the mansion demolished, making way for a small subdivision of luxury homes. But that wasn't the end of the story. As late as 2014, a man sued his realtor after discovering his home was built on the approximate site of List Mansion and was considered haunted. And I actually found a news article I'm going to read here. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's about the guy who sued in 2014. And this comes from the TravelersToday.com article is written by Althena Sirad, which I probably mispronounced now, I'm sorry. And the headline reads, Bill List, Toddville Mansion, photos, decades-old murder in Seabrook, Texas. Mansion scares man out of lease. Bill List, Toddville Mansion, had been circling on the internet lately when its dark history with former owner Bill List scared the man who was leasing it today. The shadowed past of Bill List, Toddville Mansion, is reportedly already a decades-old Seabrook murder. However, even decades of time can erase the fear upon the man who was supposed to lease the mansion. The Seabrook Villa by the Sea in Texas is situated inside the quaint and small-gated community of Galveston Bay. Bill List, Toddville Mansion, they keep doing that, it's written kind of weird, is a property on Toddville Road. Despite its big structure, it unfortunately contains a dark past of Bill List. Bill List is where Bill... 
The Bill List Toddville Mansion is where Bill List, a 57-year-old business tycoon with a record of sexually molesting teenage boys, lived. History reports that Bill List Toddville Mansion was built by Bill himself. The 34,000 square foot mansion was where a crime happened one night in October 1984. According to history, four teenage boys who Bill allegedly molested came at the house, shot Bill to death with his own gun. The Bill List Toddville Mansion was then divided into 18 lots where 13 houses now stand. 514 Villa Drive is one of these houses and is currently listed for sale at $1.5 million for the lease of $5,900 a month. Built in 2006, the two-story house contains four bedrooms, perfect for any family who do not know its history. According to KHOW-TV, a would-be tenant near Golan recently signed a lease. However, he told KHAU he signed without knowing the Bill List Todgeville Mansion history. Now he tells the news station that he wouldn't move into the mansion even if the owners paid him. Golan said, A lot of people say there's shadows of children. People say that they wouldn't come to my house as a guest. It is unknown whether 514 Villa Drive is the house in Bill List. Okay, I'm going. I'm. This thing is written very weird. Is the house where Bill List was shot to death? However, Golan is adamant that it doesn't make any difference. The Neighborhood Homeowners Association, former Vice President Kathleen Moyer, said it was unlikely that 514 Villa Drive is the exact place where the where List was murdered, as it is close to the water. The mansion at 303 Ville Toddville Road leads toward the end of the property. Moyer said Thursday, I do sympathize with the gentleman who leased the house, but it was decades ago. It's not like an existing home with someone that someone got murdered in. Moyer and her husband said that they had lived in the community for five years. They had to move in January this year for reasons not related to the history of Bill List. Moyer added, it's a wonderful place to live. I miss living there. A Houston Chronicle article published in November 18, 1985, states that Bill List, the Bill List Mansion, is a three-story mansion divided into two wings. It has an atrium in the center and a catwalk between the wings at the second level. There's also a 40-foot swimming pool at the bottom of the atrium. Other rooms in the Bill List Mansion include a ballroom, game room, dining room, kitchen, and master bedroom. One night, List was shot to death. The young man... The now famous Bill List Mansion reportedly decided to shoot List as they were tired of the mistreatment towards them. Albert Even Smiley Homan was the one who pulled the trigger. He reportedly pleaded guilty to the murder and sentenced to 45 years in prison. Bill List, Tosmo Mansion, doesn't seem to be the common denominator in List ill luck. Apparently, his daughter, Deborah Thornton, was also killed by a pickaxe from Carla Faye Tucker. Uh... That article is interesting because it does go into what Ty said at the end of a story about the guy leasing it and going, no, I don't want it. But it is terribly written. Uh, if you notice about halfway through, I kind of had to edit some of it out. Because it just keeps, every time it talks about Bill List or the mansion, it calls it, it says Bill List, Tosville Mansion. It just, it's bad. But it's an interesting story. It almost could have been a full episode, or not a full episode, but it could have been one of the main segments. It's got some ghost stuff in there. It's got some true crime stuff in there. But that's not the only story we have tonight. We also have a little, another another true crime, some little true crime stuff this week. From Sandy, who also does The Woods Podcast. And she wrote in to tell me, Hey, we followed you on Twitter, and I saw your tweet saying that you wanted to put uh, our small town secrets on your show. We both live in a small town called Martinsville, Saskatchewan, in Canada. In the 90s, there was a huge satanic panic and people claiming that a satanic cult was kidnapping children and, por- and performing satanic ritual abuse. Worth a look, much love. And I did find, uh, this did happen, I did find some information about it. So here, this is, what, this is what I was able to find out. It was in 1992 when a mother of a young child accused a small local babysitting and daycare service of sexually abusing her child. From that one report, other accusations would snowball. The allegations would go past sexual abuse into satanic ritualistic practices. This alleged satanic cult was known as the Brotherhood of the Ram. More than a dozen persons, including five police officers, would be hit with over a hundred charges. 
In all, more than 30 kids were said to have been victims of this cult. John Popowicz, which was one of the accused officers, uh, had never heard of satanic abuse before, and this case intrigued him. But because of his interest, he became a suspect. However, charges were dropped when none of the children could ID him in any of the three separate lineups that he was a part of. All the satanic abuse claims turned out to be false. However, Travis Sterling, the son of the family that owned the daycare, did get indicted on two counts of sexual assault and was the only person convicted. Popowicz and others were awarded large cash settlements in the aftermath of the scandal. I know Popowicz got like 1.5 million, which is not a bad chunk of change. And that's been this week's listener stories. If you have a listener story, you have an experience to report, uh, like you saw Bigfoot, you saw a UFO, or your house is haunted, or the site of a grisly murder, or your town just has some odd history, and you want it to be on the show, then go ahead and send it in. The easiest way to do it is go to stscast.com. If you scroll down to the bottom of the main page, there's an email submission form. That's that's probably the best way. It helps me keep it organized. But if you want, you can also get, get at me on uh, social media, mainly Twitter, and uh, let me know about your story well as well. And if it's a good one, I will throw it on a future episode of the show. And that about does it for this week's episode. I'm going to do all the plugs now. Like I said, if you have a story, go to stscast.com and send it in. You can also find other stuff on the website, as well as merch. I've got some t-shirts on there. I've got some phone cases. I've got a sticker. You can find the show notes for this episode. You can listen to this episode on it. If for some reason you can't find it on whatever you're listening this on to, you'll find some pictures, all that great stuff. Please follow the show on social media. Uh, Facebook and Twitter have the same username, and that is at STScast on both of those. I'm also on Instagram, and that is at STScast.gram. I would like to thank everyone for listening to the show, for supporting the show. If you like it, then leave a review, uh, subscribe to it on your podcatcher of choice, especially if it's iTunes, and really just tell people about it. If you have friends that are into this as well, let them know. Get them to listen. That would be great. It all helps the show grow. It all, all helps it get there. So once again, thanks everyone for listening. And I'll be back in a couple weeks with another episode of Small Town Secrets. Remember, every town has a secret. What is yours?